Our Barcelona walking tour is bringing us from the old Gothic quarter into La Ribera. This street separates the Gothic quarter from another historical quarter where we are now called La Ribera. La Ribera, Ribera in Spanish means by the water side. This was a neighborhood that started to be populated outside the Roman walls in the 1200s, 13th century, yes? There was no more space there to live, so merchants, seafaring people, the guilds of craftsmen come to live here next to the sea. The streets still carry nowadays the names of the guilds that, for example, had their workshops and homes there. Like this street is called Argentaria, Carrera de Argentaria. Argent means silver, that's in Catalan language. Yes, silver smiths street. So let's say the Gothic quarter was the political and religious center of the city, while here was a little bit more let's say, poorer quarter, or more modest quarter, with merchants, seafaring people, artisans, okay? It's very nice. It's a quarter that in the last 20 years, it really has uh, experimented a rebirth. In the last 20 years have come here to live a lot of young people, but people between 25 and 35 years old, still single often, we marry later nowadays. They are young professionals, independent professionals, maybe designers, architects, or... The arrival of this social group made that the, the quarter started to be trendy and they opened wine bars, little restaurants, little shops of designers. They call it little Soho of Barcelona, no? like the one of New York. Let's walk on it, it's, it's very nice. Part of our series, Walking Through Barcelona with Sandra. This is our quarter where in the evenings a lot of people go out to have a glass of wine or some little bit, a little bite. Little tapas, exactly, there are a lot of tapas places. Did you eat tapas already here? Yes. Huh? Yes? Yeah. This quarter where we are is built around this beautiful basilica called Santa Maria del Mar. And La Basilica de Santa Maria del Mar was built between uh, the years uh, 1329 and 1384. I really remark the time because it was built in only 55 years, which Although it may sound a lot, it's not very much because normally these big churches of such a size, that is like the cathedral of Barcelona, they took much longer, 150 years, 200 years. They were built slowly with donations of the faithful when there was not much more money because there was, a, I don't know, a plaque or a war and maybe they don't have money. They stop it, continue later, yes. And, but this one was relatively fast built because the quarter was very populated and needed soon a new church. And then everybody helped donating work or money. The artisans of the wood or the stone or the painting, they will donate their work. The seafaring people used to work at the harbor loading and unloading ships. They helped transporting the, stones, uh, the, the stone blocks from the stone quarry. So they built it relatively fast. It's considered a Catalan pure Gothic church, which represents the Catalan churches, austere facades, big round shaped rose windows, two bell towers, octagonal shape, finished flat. And inside you're gonna see, very poorly decorated. Big, but poorly decorated, only stone walls around. It's magnificent, it's really pretty. We're gonna have a quick look inside, okay? Let's go a moment inside. So what do you think? Do you like it? It's really pretty. I think it's very pretty because although it's very big, very impressive, no, the size, but it, it's also uh, at the same time kind of modest right? because it's, it's poorly decorated, very modest. This was the quarter of the modest people, yes, and here normally the nobles or members of the court kings wouldn't come, or members of the church wouldn't come. It's just for the seafaring, for these traders, for these artisans. In Europe, in France, Germany, in England, they also have a lot of Gothic architecture. But normally the Gothic churches in the rest of Europe tend to have a central nave. Uh, the interior is divided into three naves, three galleries separated by columns. But the central gallery, gallery the central nave, is much higher than the side ones to reach heaven. Right? But in the case of Catalonia, our churches 
were built with three naves having almost the same size. So not much higher the central one, giving an impression that is only one nave and like very big with enough space for everybody, like getting a bit closer to the earth. The main altar is very simple. It has a little pillar where on the top is the sculpture of the Virgin Mary carrying the baby, Jesus, because the name of the basilica is Santa Maria del Mar, eh? the church of the Lady of the Sea, eh? or the Virgin of the Sea. This is a, 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 a church where a lot of couples in Barcelona like to get married. It's true that we are not that faithful anymore. In Spain it's calculated that only a 35% really of the, of the population practices the Catholicism. No? But still we are quite traditional. Also in the city of Barcelona, uh, the, the community is very cosmopolitan. It's one of the three largest ports in the Mediterranean Sea. It's a city that has been always used to see people coming and going, from the north of Europe, uh, coming by sea. So it's also a very open mind society, the one from Barcelona, because we always had foreigners, and they brought us their influences, their religions, their habits. Yeah? And in the case of Barcelona nowadays, we have members of the Jewish community, we have Muslims, we have uh, Buddhists, we have people who are not faithful at all. So it's very blended. In, in the city only live 1.7 million, but in the whole metropolitan area, 4 million. The city plus the suburbs. All right, let's go out. We're continuing our walk through the Ribera neighborhood of Barcelona with our local guide Sandra Benzal, who's bringing us first to a nut shop and then along a main pedestrian lane, Carrera de Moncada, and passing the Picasso Museum, one of the very nice pedestrian zones in Barcelona. Part of our series, Walking Through Barcelona with Sandra. I wanted to show you, eh? this is a really nice, enchanting shop. Casa Gispert was opened in 1851 by two brothers. They used to, to, to import uh, overseas uh, products from, from America, from the Spanish colonies, like cocoa, like tea, or nuts. Well, still they have this little shop that they, they sell all kinds of hazelnuts, almonds, walnuts, olive oil. Uh, uh, jams, uh, coffee. They have an old oven that they toast always, still nowadays, the, the almonds, for example, has a nut, and you can take them home. We have a quick look and go out. Eh? It's really pretty, the building, the, the shop. In our modern retail world, where all the shops look alike and they're big chain stores, it's a refreshing break to step back into an old-fashioned shop like this. Actually, it's 160 years old, this, this wood, wood fire oven. Still working, eh? This is not something very common, eh? It's not something you find in a lot of shops in Barcelona. It's, this is the oven they use to toast the nutty. She's gonna show you how it works. Wow. And they put there the wood, and inside that cylinder there are the nuts. Almonds or hazelnuts. Or... The fire doesn't touch really the nuts. Only comes the smokes, the smoke. So that's why they have a little smoking uh, taste, flavor. The only existing oven, uh, wood fire oven, is still in Europe. The only one remaining is still in use in Europe. Casa Gispert. They've got several varieties of roasted nuts, including the almonds especially, and macadamia nuts. They've got cashew, pistachio, and they've got hazelnut. These are all roasted in that wood-fired oven with no salt. You can purchase them freshly roasted right out of these bins, or you can get a package to take away and eat later. Either way, they're going to be delicious. The shop sells a variety of other food products, including dried fruits, oils, vinegars, herbs and spices, coffee and tea, and they even have a wine cellar, and they sell chocolates as well. It's easy to find right next to the large church of Santa Maria del Mar. And then we continue on to Carrer de Moncada. We are still in this quarter called La Ribera. And uh, now we are in front of uh, one alley, a little street, called Moncada. Moncada. Moncada was the family name of one well-known family of traders that lived there in the 14th century. And that is still standing in their house. Now when we enter, we're going to see that 
all nice gates of 14th century houses, one built next to the other, where different families lived in the past. Normally these houses have, in the ground floor, you have a nice patio, and in the ground floor is where normally these families, when living there, they will have the storing room for the, no, the, the wine, the olive oil, the cereals. They also in this ground floor, they had the kitchen, they had the stables for the animals. Then in the first floor is where the family lived, had their private rooms, and in the second floor is where the service people lived, the mates. And we, we will walk through and you will see it. Five of these houses are hosting nowadays the Picasso Museum of Barcelona. Picasso lived in Barcelona when he was young. Pablo Ruiz Picasso was a Spanish painter who was born in Malaga, which is a city in the southeast of Spain, about 500 miles away from here. But when he was 14 years old, his family moved to Barcelona. His father was a drawing teacher, and he was teaching drawing in the School of Fine Arts of Barcelona. So that was the first contact of Picasso with us. And here he really loved the city because it was much bigger than Malaga, where he came from. And he was a young, a young observer always of the society. And in this museum you see a lot of drawings and paintings that he made when he's 14, 15, 16 years old. Really young, teenager. But he has a gift to paint, a paint and draw. And he catch up uh, the, the faces of the people he sees in Barcelona, sailors, prostitutes as well, drunkards on the street, but also elegant families going to the opera theatre, or maybe a priest walking on the street. This is already the Picasso Museum. We are walking along these houses, there were so five houses linked today. Here he also went to the School of Art to learn the technique but also really was born with a gift. No? And this, this museum shows you a lot of this young period of Picasso. I mean, he was 14 and 20 years old, which you don't tend to find anywhere else in the world. Because this was a donation. These paintings are a donation made by Picasso to the city of Barcelona, and also made by a friend of his, that also was his personal secretary. Since 1963, the museum is, is open. The back streets of Barcelona. Continuing our walking tour through Barcelona, we're going to bring you into one of the most wonderful food markets in town. We are still in La Ribera Quarter, eh? by the waterside quarter. Let's say. And here in this quarter we have this market called Mercat de Santa Caterina, St. Catherine's Market. In 1840s they, they opened the market. Nowadays though, this market has been refurbished and the design of this uh, refurbishment has been made by a Catalan architect called Enric Miralles. And he made this ceiling, this roof, that is all wavy because it's a tribute to Antoni Gaudí. Wavy because Gaudí always made wavy shapes. There are no straight lines, no corners in Gaudí's buildings. So everything organic, inspiring the nature. And the nature is not straight, it's always curvy. On the roof, completely covered with a mosaic of ceramic. It's all colorful, reds, yellows, oranges, green. Because also another characteristic of Gaudí's buildings is the use of mosaics with ceramic tiles, decorating facades, decorating benches, decorating parts of the buildings. The, these wood pieces really remind us to the pallets that they use, the, the, the retailers, to transport the, the, the vegetables, the fruits, to carry them no? from, from the warehouse to the shop. So it's the pallets no? used by the traders. It's a little tribute to the commerce, to the trade, because this is a market. I find it also interesting. It's really nice, very good quality products always. We will walk through and then we will exit it through the other side. Really nice, it's a market of all kinds of food, yes. These markets normally are open until 8 o'clock in the evening and then the people when they finish work at 5 or 6 they come by and do the shopping. In the mornings it's quiet, only maybe elder people who are retired they can come by. Or, otherwise the ones working don't, don't come in the mornings in a normal day. On Saturday it's busier, it's very busy. On Saturday. From here you can notice beauty, beautifully yeah, the, the mosaic of the roof. It's really nice. In many postcards of Barcelona showing you like some of the contemporary architecture of the city, you're going to see this market. It also won a prize of the best building in Barcelona in 2006 it was. Then I wanted to show you here, there is the entrance to a restaurant. It's called Santa Caterina Quina, St. Catherine's Kitchen, let's say. And normally it's open for lunch, at one o'clock it opens. 
something that we, we eat quite late in Spain. Eh? For lunch, often the restaurants open at 1 or 1.30 and close at 4. And for dinner, they open at 8 or 8.30 until 12 midnight. It's a very good restaurant. Yeah? There is a nice tapas bar in, at the entrance for little snacks, little tapas. And then behind is the restaurant, it opens at 1. Rice, pasta, vegetables, uh, uh, meat, Indian food, Chinese as well, Mediterranean. Really, it's a very popular restaurant, very trendy now. Really good food, good ingredients. Try to come when they open, like at 1 o'clock for lunch or at 8 o'clock for dinner, because the Spanish come later. If you come at 7, you can only find the bar open here, this bar, where you see that they make some tapas and you sit on the stool at the bar. But if you want to sit down in the tables, inside that they serve you the food later. And the offices start at 8 or at 9 o'clock. I mean, even if we have dinner late, we get up early. Eh? Normally, it's 7 o'clock, everybody's up, or maybe earlier, and go to work at 8 or at 9. And then you do a lunch break between maybe uh, between 2 and 3, or 2 and 4. Sometimes two hours lunch break, a long lunch break. And then you work again from 4 until 7. So the day is long. You finish at 7, you get home around 8 because often you work outside, you work in the city, but maybe you live outside the city. So it's long days. And that's by the time you get home, it's at 8 or 8.30, then you prepare dinner, it's already 9. So really everything goes together with the, the habit of the land, no? the working hours we have. You do know about the tapas of Spain, this great little snack food. And now we're gonna show you some of the best in Barcelona with our guide, Sandra. It's very normal, very, very typical in our country to, to share tapas with your husband or with a group of friends with all these little dishes, little plates, plates on the table that you share. A plate of uh, fried squid, uh, fried squid calamari, or maybe cheese or little salmon, whatever. But then, in the Basque country, which is the name of a region, a Spanish region in the north of Spain, normally in the Basque country, they eat tapas in another way. I'm saying that because this bar in front of you is a Basque taberna. Normally the people go to the bar, they stand and they help themselves from those plates that you see in front of you where there are montaditos. Montaditos are pieces of uh, slices of bread mounted hmm, with something, like can be a croquette of, uh, no, of chicken or some salmon with creamy cheese and some herbs, you know, or a little fried uh, sausage with also with, uh, no, with some vegetable and then everything is stick together with a toothpick. Very important the toothpick because you pay by toothpick and at the end you, you, you show the toothpicks to the waiter. You say look I had four, I had five and you pay by toothpick. It's not very expensive and with actually four or five you already feel filled because you have a lot of nice slices. It's very popular. These Basque bars in Barcelona are very popular because it's a, it's a let's say a quick way to eat but it's nice, it's really great food, good, good quality ingredient. A tapa is usually an appetizer. You eat a lot, you don't need anything else. And in the Basque country, they invented this kind of tapa, they don't call it tapa, but it's also an appetizer. But like that, instead of a plate, it's individual little bites. The word tapa, tapa means lead. The cover of something, lead or lead? A lead. A lead, the lead of a can or of a box, a lead. So we call it tapas, this kind of appetizers that you eat with a glass of wine or beer, because they have their origin in the south of Spain, in Andalusia. It seems like 100 years ago, when normally a, a client will go to a bar and will order a glass of wine or beer, in the summer there was next to the water, next to the sea, was heat and humidity, and there were a lot of flies around, no? And then normally so the waiter will bring the glass of beer or, or wine with something to eat with, like a little free given uh, bite that could be a little piece of fresh Spanish omelette just cooked, or maybe a little bit of ham with cheese, anything. And you know, normally it came on a little plate on the top, like a lid on the top of the glass. So it was given free to the client to eat with a drink, probably so they will get thirstier and will order a second glass of beer <laughs> or thing but also covering the glass to avoid that the flies will go inside. So it was like a lid. 
the bite, the appetizer. And that's where the name comes from, La Tapa. It's a tapa, it's a you eat. Nowadays in Barcelona, you always pay for the tapas. It's quite an expensive city. But in other parts of Spain, especially in small towns, they still give you for free the tapa. You order a glass of wine, always a little bite on the side. It's very really nice. After such a wonderful introduction, we have worked up an appetite. So of course, we're gonna go in and have it some keeps tapas. Going around the bend. We're going to leave you with these tasty images to help you work up your appetite to come back for more Barcelona movies. Find them in our collection. And blood sauce, that's really good.